Okay. So kia ora katou. My name is Jonathan Marshall, and I am a Associate Professor in Statistics at Massey University, and I am the course coordinator for 161122 uh, Statistics. So I'm kind of the person in charge, if you like. Uh, so the first thing I will say is if you have any uh, questions uh, about the course of, of an administrative nature, um, then I'm the right person to see. Um, I'm also the academic lead for statistics, um, so I deal with all of the um, all queries of an academic nature, I guess. So if you're interested in any other statistics, statistics courses or you just want to chat about um, anything to do with stats, um, you're welcome to uh, fire me off an email and I'm happy to chat with you. Okay, so welcome. Uh, so the teaching team for this uh, course is uh, three individuals, two Jonathans, so myself and Jonathan Godfrey, um, and uh, we're both uh, based uh, in Palmerston North in the Manawatu. Our offices are right next to each other if you happen, happen to be in the area, um, and uh, the third person is Matt Pawley, who is uh, based out of Albany. And so the course is broken into essentially three chunks. Um, so the first four weeks is what uh, I will be teaching, leading the teaching on, uh, and then Jonathan Godfrey will be taking over for topic B, which is the uh, weeks uh, five through eight, and then Matt will be taking over for topic C, uh, which is weeks nine through 11 or 12. Um, the best way to contact me is uh, via email uh, or um, just send me a message on the Discord, uh, which I'll get to in, in a moment. Um, obviously, if you're in and around Palmerston North, you're welcome to come and knock on my door. Um, I'm in Science Tower B on Level 3, where most of the statisticians and mathematicians are. Um, notice, uh, you'll notice if you do that, uh, I may not answer it because I might not be in. Um, so uh, with the times that we're living in, <laughs> I do tend to um, work from home uh, fairly often. Uh, so Thursday and Friday, I will be uh, definitely in. Um, I'm also available on Zoom. So if you check out the stream site, uh, you'll see that I will be, uh, for the first four weeks at least, um, available uh, in this time slot. So from 12 to 1 on Monday, and I think it's also 12 to 1 on Tuesday. So essentially, what were the uh, timetabled lecture time uh, lecture times? Uh, I will be available on Zoom at those times for drop-in sessions if if you want. Um, uh, that's an option. Uh, so who am I? Um, well, I said I was Jonathan Marshall, associate professor in stat statistics. Um, I have a dog and a child. Um, uh, this is Samuel, um, and this is Minnie, golden retriever. Uh, Samuel is now uh, five and a half, so he's at school. Um, so a bit older than that photo looks, obviously. Uh, and I'm essentially interested in the statistical modeling of disease. So um, it's kind of like a good time, I guess, <laughs> for, that, for that interest. Um, with, you know, we've just sort of, well, we're still in really a, a global pandemic. Um, and so... Uh, the, uh, the tools that I uh, develop and the sort of statistical models that I uh, utilize are, are quite popular at the moment. And so two of the main areas that I work in is uh, source attribution of disease and spatiotemporal modeling of disease. Um, so spatiotemporal modeling especially has been used during COVID. And I've done some COVID modeling. I've got a master's student currently looking at um, modeling wastewater um, and am on the wastewater modeling group. Uh, and also source attribution is the is where you um, essentially use genomic information to infer where um, the population is getting a particular illness from. So, for example, a lot of the work I've done is on uh, Campylobacter. Uh, so the disease is Campylobacteriosis. You get it from the bacteria, uh, Campylobacter. And Campylobacter lives in the gut of um, uh, warm, well, of mammals and birds and various other things. Um, and so humans get infected with Campylobacter, typically through eating food or um, from uh, the environment. 
And so we're interested in what food sources um, um, are more risky than others and so on. So that's the process of source attribution. And you can click on those links if you're interested in them. So what are we going to do uh, in the course? Uh, well, for the first four weeks, the weeks that I take, um, essentially, um, we're going to be introducing you to the tools that we use uh, as statisticians to uh, look at data. So we're going to be looking at some, um, first of all, what the tool is and, and sort of getting, getting up to speed with how we use it. Uh, we're going to be looking at some charting uh, or visualization uh, using that tool. So we're going to be looking at the ggplot2 package for that. Um, and uh, basically how to how to do graphs and how to read graphs and all that sort of stuff. Um, we'll be looking at how we can use these tools uh, in a reproducible manner um, to make sure that, um, you know, next week when we come back to the same um, analysis that we did last week, um, that it still works. Uh, and then we'll look at um, some data transformation so um, taking data as it comes in the wild, if you like, um, which can be not in the form that's useful for uh, analyses or useful for making a chart necessarily, um, and how we can sort of get it into shape so that we can use it. Um, and that gets to the importance of tidy data. So tidy data um, is data that we can use um, for all of the above operations. And most of the data that you'll be seeing will be pre-tidied um, by us. Um, but we'll be looking at some untidy data to figure out how to get it into that right form. Uh, so a question in the chat, uh, will we have access to computer labs in our lectures labs as my laptop is an older version and doesn't allow the download of RR Studio? Uh, so two things. First of all, uh, if you have um, an issue uh, installing the software, um, then please get in contact with me because I might be able to help solve it. Uh, no guarantees. Um, but I have some experience in this, so may be able to um, get it working on your on your uh, device. Um, but even if we can't get it working on your device, then there's another couple of options available to us. So, for example, you can access the computing lab environments uh, that are locally here on campus. So either at the Albany campus and the Manawatu campus, the the computers that you use when you go to a computing lab, a physical computing lab, um, are just dumb terminals that talk to a remote server. And you can talk to the, the remote server from your own device as well. Uh, so these, uh, if you go to remote.massey.ac.nz, um, uh, you get that, uh, that lab environment and, and RStudio is installed on that lab environment. So you can do it uh, in a browser or via the, via the uh, remote desktop uh, software. Uh, the other option is that uh, RStudio, or POSIT as it's now known, uh, offers a cloud-based product. So you can uh, use um, RStudio in the cloud as well. So if you go to cloud.rstudio.com, uh, you've got that available to you as well. That is time limited, um, but I think the amount of free hours that you get with it is probably enough for, um, for the course. I think it's about 50 hours a month or, or something, which should be enough to, to sort of do everything you need as well. Uh, but yes, if you have any issues uh, installing r, &R Studio, just, just get in contact and we can see if we can sort it out. Okay, so um, r, r Studio. so R is uh, quite an old um, piece of software. It's essentially a, a, a computing language uh, that's uh, written for the express purpose of um, performing statistics. Uh, it's actually based on an older piece of software called S. Um, you'll see that statisticians aren't very good at naming things. Um, and it was started in Auckland um, by uh, Ross E. Harker and uh, Robert uh, Gentleman, um, but has sort of exploded around the world and is used by thousands and developed by thousands. Um, and one of the goals of this course is that you will learn to write code uh, to do the analyses. So um, the reason we use R and R Studio for uh, teaching statistics is it's essentially the tools that we use as statisticians. So we don't teach you things that we don't actually use um, and uh, is completely free and uh, open to you and has a really uh, supportive online community. So if you need help in R and R Studio, uh, you can find lots of it online. 
um, and allows you to do the sort of work that we do um, in a reproducible manner. Now, there is a bit of a learning curve. Uh, so obviously you are writing code and code has to be, you know, there's a bunch of rules around that language. Um, and if you disobey the rules, the computer will shout errors at you. Uh, you'll see, hopefully, uh, when I demo it in a, in, a, in a few minutes, that I make errors all the time. Um, of course, I'm probably a, a lot faster at solving those errors uh, because I've made so many of them. Um, and you should expect to get lots of errors um, in your work, and hopefully they will tail off over time. Um, so we, inter we interact with R via the R Studio front end. Um, so R Studio is rebranded to Posit, is the name of their company now. And that's run by a bunch of people who um, also developed um, the packages that we use for R. And uh, there's a link there um, for how to install it if you wish to on your own computer. As I said, uh, both uh, the software is also available via the uh, Massey laboratory environments. Uh, getting help. Um, there's a number of uh, ways that you can uh, contact us. Um, so obviously uh, we have stream, you can use the forums on there and people already have, and that's great. Um, I find personally that stream is a very slow way of asking for help uh, because there's quite a, a, a long lag time between you posting on the stream forum and me looking at it. Um, I don't get a notification that you've posted um, until sort of the, the daily digesty thing comes out. So it's probably going to be at least 24 hours before I see it. And if it's over a weekend, obviously, it's, it, it may well be not until Monday. Um, a really good alternative, which I highly recommend, is we do have a Discord channel. This was set up by a student in 122 um, two years ago, maybe possibly three years ago, and is really fantastic. Um, it's essentially a internet relay chat type thing. Um, some of you might have heard of Slack, which is kind of a corporate version of Discord, I suppose. Um, so Discord is sort of more, um, oh, it's a bit more like anarchy, I suppose, to a certain extent, um, compared to um, something more formal like Slack. Um, anyway, it's you have to have a username, but other than that, it's easy to sign up. Um, the advantage of that is that um, you can immediately get uh, feedback um, Perhaps not from me, although I do idle in the channel and I'm happy to help you uh, as soon as I see it. Um, but um, typically the turnaround is a lot faster. Um, one thing we really do encourage is that you talk to each other. So if you have a problem, um, ask. Um, I might answer or one of the other teaching staff might answer or uh, one of your classmates might, uh, may, may know the answer to that question as well. And I do encourage you to help. If you do know the answer to something or even if you have an idea, um, please do um, try and help each other. Uh, one of the the, the many ways uh, of improving your knowledge of something is to try and help someone else out with it and because you quickly discover what you don't know, perhaps, um, as you try and explain it to something else. Um, when you do ask a question, I do ask that you try and help us answer it. So try and give us as much information as you can. So, for example, if you have um, a, a coding issue um, so you've tried some code and it gives you an error message or whatever, um, copy and paste that code in the email or in the Discord session or onto stream uh, so that I can run the code, right? So that I can see the, spot, the, the problem. If I can't see your code and I just see the error message, then I'm not going to infer, or it's going to be hard for me to infer what the actual problem is. Um, use the tools that are available uh, for you. So Google is super useful for R. Um, and our studio help in general. Um, include uh, R and our studio in the, in the Google search, or if you're using a particular package, we'll talk about those later, such as ggplot, um, then include ggplot in your, in your um, query. Um, obviously, there are other things that are fancier than Google now. Um, I'm sure you all know of things, uh, large uh, language models such as um, ChatGPT and so on. Uh, you're welcome to use ChatGPT to uh, assist your learning, i.e. to ask questions. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful of uh, ChatGPT, just like you've got to be careful of Google. Um, so for example, um, if you're Googling something, then check the date of the, of the Google, um, the various things that you've Googled, right? Because older results um, are likely to be out of date. 
So some of the tools that we use progress quite quickly and change quite quickly. And so some of the older code might work, but might not be uh, sort of what we're used to seeing. And while there's nothing wrong with you using any code that you find, um, you've got to, it's, it's important that you understand what's going on, right? And it's the same with ChatGPT and other um, AI tools. Um, you can ask these tools uh, to write code for you, and they will do so. Um, and that code is often good. However, recognizing that it's good is an important skill, right? And it's a, probably an important skill that many of you don't have yet. So just be careful about using those tools in that they are actually doing what you think they're doing, okay? But there's nothing wrong with using them as a head start. Uh, there will be a, a policy on the use of chat GPT in assessments, and um, that will be up on stream um, uh, this week. Um, in general, the idea is that I have no problem if you use it, um, particularly for assignments uh, work, for example, and for your workshops and for your learning. Um, uh, but I do ask that if you use it in an assessment, in particular in an assignment type environment, that you cite it. So tell me you've used it. Uh, this is both useful for me because uh, often I want to know where you got that chunk of code from because it's not what I might expect, for example. Um, and so it's useful to me. Oh, right, you got it from ChatGPT. That's fine. Or And then I can sort of look at it and, and see whether it's uh, both better than what I write. Um, and um, is actually answering the question. So if you use it in assignments, please cite it. I ask that you do not use it in a test situation, okay? The tests are there um, to assess what you know, and that's not what a machine knows, okay? It is quite clear when students have used it in a test, Okay, at least at the moment, this probably will change, right? In a couple of years' time, I probably won't be able to tell um, uh, the difference between a, a AI generated answer and a student generated answer. But at the moment, I can, or at least I'm reasonably good at it. Okay, um, but the purpose of that is assessment, i.e., assessing what you know, and so we ask that you actually do it yourself. Okay. Um, Yes, so uh, William's written in the chat that often the code generated by ChatGPT needs to be tweaked. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, so for example, ChatGPT won't have the data set that you have in front of you. Okay, so um, while you might ask it to, you know, give me the give me the code to do a particular graph, you may need to uh, ch change the, the column names and all that sort of stuff, right? Okay. So I asked you all to fill in a form, and some of you did. Um, about what you think statistics is. And so we're gonna have a look at that data now as sort of a, an introduction to some of the things that you can do in RStudio. So let me switch screens to that. Uh, I think it's this one. Okay, so hopefully you should see RStudio. And I'm not going to sort of go around and point where various things are, but basically um, too much anyway. Uh, this is um, the window that we'll be doing all the typing in generally, uh, just an editor. Uh, this is where the code is run down here, and this is where plots end up over here, and this is where your, your data and stuff end up. So I'm going to read that data in. And we're going to have a look at it. Let's load that up. So this is what the data looks like. This is the top 10 rows of the data. So this is straight out of Google. So you fill in the Google form, it then goes to a Google sheet, and then I click download. So this is what it looks like. So you can see the first person was on the July, July the 3rd. Okay, and their, their words and phrases were data visualization, data modeling, and probabilities. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to get a sense for what you think about statistics. And so what I want to do is sort of count the number of times different things show up in each of these columns. Now, I don't care about the order. So really what I want to do first is I'm going to combine these three columns together um, into one. So I just have, um, essentially, I take the three entries and just switch them from being in three separate columns to being in three separate rows. Okay, so that's what the pivot pivot longer command is doing. I'll make it a little bit larger. It shows up on the recording a bit better. 
Okay, so now if we have a look at word list, you can see that I've taken those three columns um, and I've put them into two, one of which, which describes which column it was in. So you can see I've got word phrase one, word phrase two, word phrase three repeated, and then I've got those same three entries. So now I've got, just got a single column with all the, all the stuff in it. Okay, and what I'm going to do is do a bar chart. So what I want to know is how many um, is how many of each type of word there are. And there we go. We've got a chart that has gone counted up all our words. And you can see the words very clearly there on the uh, x-axis, or perhaps very unclearly, because of course um, they're all overlapping, right? We've got so many different words. But I can immediately see from this, even though I can't actually see which words it is, I can immediately see that there are some popular ones, right? So there are some ones that, that show up a bunch, and then there are some ones that only show up once, which are all these ones down here. Okay, so to figure out what the words are, we might want to switch that plot around so that the counts are on the x-axis and the words are on the y-axis. And there we go. We're getting something there. Okay. <clears throat> right. Uh, now what I spot is that I spot that we actually have some words uh, so, so I've got both uh, both some words, and I also have um, some phrases, right? That are more complicated. But those phrases, of course, contain words that might be um, relevant. So, one thing we might want to do is take those phrases and split them up into separate words, and then count the words, right? Because some of these phrases will have the word data in them, for example. So, such as that top one, working with data. So, obviously, data is important, right? To that to that person. Right, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to use a package called um, I don't remember how to do it. Uh, it's called tidy text and um, there's, a, there's a function in it called unnest token which basically splits up um, sentences into words. I think that's how it works. Let's check. Ah, I could not find um, this token. Did I load the tidy text package? Ah, oh, tokens probably. There we go. Okay, so now you can see that. Uh, so before we had data visualization, data modeling, probabilities, data, and now. You can see that I've got data, visualization, data, modeling, probabilities, and it's happily um, also lowercase everything, which is nice. So now when I plot my words, I've only got words. Okay. Uh, there's still too, too many of them, really. So let's um, perhaps uh, filter out anything that's only got one re response. And we'll filter out. Uh, so what are we going to do? We're going to have to count the words, aren't we? All right, so we'll count them. And then we'll filter out any that only have count one. So we'll retain only those that have count one. And then we'll plot those. Ah. Now, instead of a bar chart, I want a column chart because I've got a X variable now. Because I've already done the counting. So a bar chart um, does the counting for you. A column chart is where you already have the counts. And so you have both an X and a Y for a column chart. For a bar chart, you only have an X or a Y. Okay, so here we go. So those are the uh, terms that are more popular. Uh, oh, there's of and and. Those are kind of useless, aren't they? So we can get rid of them um, with, uh, so that uh, what's called uh, an example of a stop word. So in text analysis, um, there's basically lists of things that aren't important, lists of words that aren't important, like of, and, the, and so on. Um, so they're called stop words. So there's a list of stop words. And so there they are there. 
um, and they have uh, uh, stop words in certain locations and not stop words in others. Let's filter those out. Uh, we've got to rename. And then we've got to count word. Okay, so now I've got rid of the and and the of. And I guess the last thing we might want to do is just reorder that chart so that we get the important ones on top. Um, so we could, um, so the word I want to reorder. Uh, is it reorder two? No, just do reorder. There we go. So you can see that what you think statistics is, or at least sort of the consensus, is that it consists of data analysis and graphs. And then the next one is probability, and we've got a bunch of other things um, that are all important as well. Okay, so that's an example of some um, of the sort of analysis that you'll end up doing, or at least subsets of that. Um, before we go on, though, I just want to go back to the unfiltered list. Okay, and we just want to print them all out. Maybe I'll... Because uh, there were some other ones that I thought were interesting. Storytelling, that's kind of a cool one. We'll, we'll be learning... Um, so we'll be learning uh, about storytelling uh, in, uh, uh, in the first four weeks. Um, there was another one, though, that I saw before. <laughs> uh, LOL. Um, yeah, challenging. There was another one. Ah, this one, overwhelming. So thank you, whoever um, put those in. Um, because it's important. So um, let me flick back to the slides. Uh, where are the slides gone here? Chat back up so I can see what's happening. Okay. Um, so it's important to recognize that we, we're not all at the same level, right? We're not all the same, right? We're all different. We've come from different backgrounds. We've come from uh, different educational uh, upbringings, um, different family experiences, different friends, lots of things, right? Um, different ages, right? There's lots of things that are different about us. And uh, for some of you, um, statistics might be overwhelming and might be challenging. Whereas for others, maybe you've done some stats before and it's sort of more in your, in your, in your, uh, in what you're familiar with. And you, and, um, and so you might find it uh, easier, right? Or less overwhelming at least. Um, and so I just want to point out that one of the, you know, one of the key jobs that we have as a teaching staff is that we're here to teach you all, right? And we, we have to recognize that you're all at different levels, okay? So if you are feeling overwhelmed or challenged or, or whatever, you need extra help, or you feel as though you need someone to talk to, then please um, do come and see me. Um, I'd also point out um, that on the Massey website, um, there's a huge amount of um, help available to you. So if you just go to www.massey.ac.nz and click on student, student life, and then click on support and help, there's a huge number of uh, counselling services, um, uh, student health uh, services, and so on. Um, there's also confidential uh, places where you can talk to about uh, things that you might not want to talk to me about, for example, um, huge numbers of um, uh, of other people that are there to help you. So please do take advantage of that. If you do need help navigating that, then please um, feel free to just shoot me an email or talk to me in person or on Discord, and I'm happy to help direct you to, to um, the right person to talk to. Okay. So you thought statistics was uh, graphs, analysis, and data, right? That's exactly what I think statistics is as well, right? So I think it's uh, uh, charts, data, and models, um, which is, uh, so models uh, replaces analysis, obviously, and charts replaces graphs. I mean, charts and graphs, same, same, same type of thing. 
Um, so those three things uh, are what I think uh, are important as well. And we're going to be looking at the first two of these at least um, in some respects, and you'll be looking at data and models uh, in more details uh, in more detail uh, later on uh, in the first four weeks. Okay, so we'll be looking at telling stories with data. Um, we'll be looking at um, why it's important to look at all our data and not just summaries of it. Um, so that the variation in the data is often what's um, the important bit. Um, and then we'll be looking at um, at uh, what the limitations of that data are and the importance of um, whether the data are random or not. And then later on in the course in topic C, we'll be looking at um, uh, actually quantifying um, the uncertainty that we had in our data and inferring relationships and so on so that we can, we can make uh, decisions. And stats to me is all about quantifying evidence while embracing the fact that we know that the data we have is not complete. So it's basically embracing the uncertainty uh, that we have and using that uncertainty to then infer things that are useful, or at least accounting for that uncertainty when we infer things that are useful. So we're going to start by looking at some charts. Um, so these are just um, some sort of some random ones, some good, some bad. Um, this is one um, that I initially thought was good. Uh, so it's a chart that was produced by me. Um, but Looking back on it, I think it's not that good. Anyway, um, but this was um, several years back, uh, well, almost 10 years ago now, I guess, um, the uh, rivers or the way we grade um, water quality was changed in New Zealand. Um, and there was a bunch of controversy at the time that, you know, the changes were bad and so on, um, or were they, you know, um, we, we're trying to sort of uh, fudge over the fact that maybe some, some rivers that aren't so flash are now getting higher grades than, they, than perhaps they were under the older system. Um, and so this is a visualization to, tr to, attempt, to attempt to try and explain what's going on um, with, the, with the rating system. So there's basically these um, three uh, sort of passing ratings for, for rivers, um, excellent, good, and fair, blue, green, and yellow. And then there's two failing grades, which I don't show here, um, which are orange and red. Um, but the trick with, um, with uh, water quality and um, risk to humans is, um, is that, it, first of all, it doesn't tell the whole story. So um, what this is essentially measuring is the, uh, so when, when they talk about the water quality guidelines for swimmability, they're talking about whether or not um, someone that swims in the river is likely to get uh, a disease, in particular, Campylobacter. Um, which is one of the diseases that you, um, sort of the more common diseases that you might get from um, swimming in uh, water. And it turns out that measuring Campylobacter in water is a little bit trickier than measuring some other things. So they actually infer all this by measuring a different bug E. coli, right? So we're sort of already one step back from what the truth is. Um, and the other thing that goes on, uh, well, there's two other things that go on. The first thing is that this is only water quality in respect to public health, so human health. It's not water quality in respect to, is it any good for an animal to live in, right? Is it any good for fish, for example, or for um, any of the other uh, creatures that live in um, pristine waters? Um, in fact, it might be really rubbish for those um, uh, animals, even if these um, measures are good. Uh, so there's other things that contribute to water quality um, other than uh, the public health risk. Um, but the other thing is um, that the risk is highly variable. OK, so what this graph is supposed to be saying is that um, essentially where there's no crosshatching here, the risk is really low. So it's less than 0.1%. So this is less than one in a thousand people that swim in the river during this time would get sick. So it's basically saying half the time, whether the river is graded as excellent, good or fair, doesn't matter. Half of the time, if you swim in the, the river, there's a less than one in a thousand risk of getting sick. And then the single hash, the sort of the um, uh, this next block is then um, a higher risk, so between 0.1% and 1%. So in an excellent river, then there's about a, uh, another 30% of the time that the risk then increases roughly tenfold. Um, and there's only a small chance, so less than 5% of the time, the risk is higher than 5%, and it's never higher than 15%. Now, the problem with this is that these distributions are highly skewed, okay? So when you go and measure E. coli or Campylobacter in a river, 
then most of the time you'll find none, okay? Which is why the risk is low most of the time. But every now and then you find heaps, like off the charts heaps, right? And so you're in a situation where you either have none, which is most of the time, or you have a lot, which is some of the time. Now, if you have a lot, then you're likely to get sick. If you have none at all, then you're not likely to get sick at all, right? So most of the time when you swim in a river, you're unlikely to get sick because there's no bugs there. But a small proportion of the time, there'll be lots of bugs there. And if you happen to swim at that particular time, you'll get sick, okay? So the problem is that um, the, the risk isn't even. So the, the average chance of getting sick is meaningless because the average never applies, right? The average would be, um, you know, if you averaged across all time, it would be low level risk because there's a large proportion of time where there's essentially no risk. But that doesn't capture what's actually going on because if you swim at a time that's risky, you're almost certainly going to be sick. So here's another visualization that someone else put together in response to my chart, which basically tries to translate that, that same idea. And so this is sort of a, char a chart of, I think, at least 24 blocks of 100 people, right? So there's 100 people in each of these uh, blocks. And you can see that in most of the blocks, no one's getting sick, right? So those are the times where these 100 people happen to go to the river, but there's no bugs in it, and so no one gets sick. But the times where um, they go to the river and get sick, a bunch of them are getting sick all at once, right? And that's because the number of bugs there is really, really high. Okay, so it's the variability here that's important. Okay, some other charts. Um, here's uh, quite a quite a neat one. Uh, so this is um, looking at published studies on um, that have published uh, odds ratios or relative risks for cancer uh, for various things. So it's a bunch of studies done on uh, people and to see um, you know whether whether um, a group of people were more likely or less likely to get cancer. And then they've attributed that to the, a particular thing, right? They ask questions about what they eat. And then, um, you know, they, they say, you know, wine causes cancer. And then another study comes out and says, well, actually, wine's protective against cancer. Drink more wine, you'll have less cancer, right? And as you can see that the, the um, so a relative risk of one means uh, doesn't affect cancer, basically. Um, so both groups that um, had wine and didn't have wine would be the same in terms of cancer. Um, you can see that most of these items are actually, uh, you know, there's studies to support and studies to um, negate uh, those, those things. Uh, unfortunately, not for everything. So, for example, bacon uh, seems to be uh, always bad, which isn't, isn't happy. Um, some things are always good, so olives, or at least in these studies, right? I'm sure that if they keep looking for long enough, they'll find one that's, uh, that um, is, is worse. Okay, um, so this, these are um, scientific studies that have been published, right, um, that have um, an estimate for the um, for the, the risk of these products um, in causing cancer. And you can see this huge variability. And it's the variability here that's important, right? It's not the where the middle is. It's the variability here that's important. Um, visualizations are great ways of communicating uh, with the public, or can be. Um, so um, obviously we've been through a, a, a pandemic or we're still going through a pandemic. Um, and so there's been a, a bunch of um, really nice ways of illustrating um, uh, what are potentially some, some complicated uh, topics. So, so here's one, um, for example, um, that Toby Morris and Susie Wiles did um, about you know, the, uh, the idea of exponential growth um, spread and, and how you know, stopping it early can drastically um, alter the outcome. Uh, we'll just skip over that one. Um, here's, uh, we've got a couple um, on the use of animation for visualizations. So um, particularly useful on the web. Uh, and so this was a, um, a prediction of um, the 2016 presidential uh, election. And um, this is a visualization that was put, put, put together by the New York Times. And the idea was to, um, was to help communicate the uncertainty in their prediction. So their prediction um, during the night as votes were coming in, um, obviously refined. So the um, the window here that's shaded is kind of the, the range of what they think is plausible results. 
Um, and then the needle was jumping around uh, essentially randomly within the plausible range. And this got people super um, anxious um, because people cared about the result of the election. Um, so, you, you know, the US is quite polarized. You're, you're one or the other, basically. You're uh, red or blue or whatever. Um, team A, Team B. Um, and people got really uh, upset about the fact that they were seeing the, uh, you know, the needle was jumping around and it wasn't a certain prediction. Um, and I think that this was actually um, quite a successful visualization because of the fact that it made people uh, anxious about a thing that they thought was important, right? If you think something's important then and you're not sure about the answer, then anxiety is perhaps um, an appropriate response, right? Um, here's some visualizations um, of uh, looking at compiler bacteriosis in the Manawatu. Uh, so uh, the um, right there, the green in there and the brown there is uh, Palmerston North. This is the Manawatu region. Wellington's down here. Um, <clears throat> and what this is showing is that the, the colors, uh, so the brown to green is basically showing um, your, your risk compared to the rest of the, the uh, region. So blue is lower risk and brown is higher risk. Um, and then the, the gray is the fog of uncertainty, if you like. It's um, basically, uh, so we're more uncertain out here, uh, out in the rural areas, basically, and less uncertain in the, in the urban areas, just because we have more data, right? And you can see that there's a difference between these two charts and that this, the, um, the urban area here is, tends to be greener. We've got to zoom in as well. So this is the urban area of Palmerston North Massey's out here. Okay, uh, the bridge is somewhere there. And that's the river, there's that curve there. Um, so you can see that there's a big difference. And this was pre-2007, and this is post-2007. So something's happened uh, that has meant that um, it used to be more risky to live in the city compared to the country. Um, and now it is less risky to live in the city compared to the country. And what happened in between these two things is that there was an intervention in the poultry industry um, and uh, essentially the number of compiler factor that you find on uh, chicken meat, fresh chicken meat, has, uh, has dropped dramatically. Um, and so and what was happening, of course, is that people that lived in cities are more likely to, to eat um, fresh chicken than people who live rurally. Um, there's also a bunch of other different risk factors rurally um, compared to uh, in the city. You've got exposure to, to more ruminant animals and so on. Um, obviously, visualization is a is a great way of um, of or has the potential to mislead. Uh, so charts are very easy to get wrong, um, particularly if you're not using um, appropriate tools to build them. So you'll you'll notice that getting charts wrong using R and R Studio is, is a little bit harder. You've got to be a bit more creative to come up with a misleading chart. Um, you can definitely do it. Um, you can see here that this pie chart's clearly wrong, right? And that the 30% slice here is bigger than the 35%, right? So there's some very uh, you know, trivial things wrong with that one. Uh, if you're interested in monitoring petrol prices, um, you know, this is a thing that's often in the media. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's done on it. So if you want to know how much the, um, the petrol margin is over time, you can literally see it at that website. Um, we're in election year. so. Um, I'm sure there'll be more of this sort of stuff um, coming up. So this is a, an ad put out by um, the National Party, obviously, because it shows National being lower in Labour. Um, and, you know, this has a bunch of um, things wrong with it. Um, so obviously, if you look at the numbers, $1.91 and $2.23, uh, that doesn't correspond to the length of these boxes. This box looks way bigger than this one, at least bigger than the 30 cent increase um, that is. And similarly, the amount of tax in each of these is, is, is a different proportion. So there's lots of things wrong with this chart. Um, this was actually ruled okay by the Advertising Standards Authority, um, which is interesting. Um, but there you go, uh, clearly misleading chart. I'm sure that you'll see some more of that from, from all of the teams um, <laughs> the upcoming election campaign. Uh, so the general rules when we're building chart is first of all, first and foremost, don't mislead. Um, make sure that you you um, you compare things that are that make sense to compare. Um, when you are doing particularly bar charts, 
um, or things where um, lengths or heights uh, or widths um, represent a value, uh, represent a number that is what you're wanting to um, to uh, give to your reader, um, the axes should start at zero, right? If it's a length, so your how long this thing is is important, it needs to start at zero. Um, it's useful to show where you got the data from and how you generated the chart ideally as well. Um, so we'll be seeing how to do that. And um, one of the key things that we'll be learning is that showing variation or uncertainty is important as well. Um, and sometimes that's more important than showing the overall uh, result. Okay. Um, and before we go on, here's one final one. So this is a from a, a, an old article in the Herald. Um, just look at the headline, more students cheat in exams and most are in Auckland. Um, in fact, that same article included the data. And so this is the data um, that the article included. And you can see that, that in order to get more students cheat in exams, they're actually just using the 280 and the 290. So there's 10 more um, in one year and completely ignoring, of course, the fact that there were way more in 2012. Okay, so there's actually less in 2015 than there were in 2011 and in 2012, but that doesn't make a good headline, does it? The second thing they said is most are in Auckland, and here's the numbers. Okay, again, this was actually in the uh, bottom of the article. They actually had the numbers. And yes, most were in Auckland, but of course, Auckland's our biggest city. You'd expect that, right? Um, and in fact, if we um, look at the number of students, um, in Auckland and in other areas, then sure enough, there's more in Auckland. And so we could count the, we, we could um, compute the rate, right? The number of cheats per student, if you like. Um, and we see that Auckland is high, but it's not the highest, right? It's actually the West Coast and Northland uh, have the most cheaters. Uh, and Bay of Plenty is the most honest, along with the south of the South Island, South uh, Tiger and Southland. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you'll see more of this. Uh, I mean, you see this essentially every week. There's another sort of article that, uh, has, certainly the headline, right? I mean, the headline is trying to make you click on the article. Okay, so now we're going to uh, look at uh, very quickly at how we do some charting in the software that we're going to use. So we're going to be looking at the package ggplot2. So it's a package that was written um, by um, a guy called Hadley Wickham, who... Uh, is a New Zealander again, um, and is currently the chief uh, scientist at POSIT or R Studio. And it's based on a, an idea called grammar of graphics. And essentially it's a consistent language for producing charts. Um, now it's not a concise language for producing charts um, in that there's typically quite a lot that you have to type in order to get a chart. Um, and that's because of the fact that it's very flexible, right? It can basically produce just about any chart that you want um, and um, particularly um, some quite complicated ones. Um, essentially, everything on the chart um, can be changed. And so uh, because of that, and because it's generated using code rather than pointing and clicking, you do need to type quite a bit if you want to change a bunch of stuff, okay? So um, let's look at an example. So here's a, a, a chart of the location of earthquakes. Uh, there's a thousand points on that chart, a thousand earthquakes uh, around Fiji. So Fiji's just in here somewhere, I think. And New Zealand's down here. And these are a bu bu bunch of uh, the epicenters of earthquakes. So this is longitude and latitude. And we've plotted it um, using this code up here. Okay, and we're going to be seeing this over and over and over, and indeed you'll be typing it over and over and over, or copying and pasting it and altering it accordingly. And it basically consists of three sort of blocks. We've got the ggplot bit um, uh, along with the data set. And then we've got some geometry that we add onto the plot, right? So the ggplot bit with the data tells us where we're getting our, our data for plotting from and telling the software that we want to plot. And then we have some, some geometry layer uh, that we add on, which is basically telling it uh, what type of plot we want. And then um, there's a mapping. So there's a, there's a, um, a set of, uh, a little bit of code here that relates the features of the plot to the features of our data set. 
And so in this case, we're saying that the X feature, so things along the X axis is coming from the long column in the data, and the Y axis is coming from the lat column in the data. And it's going to use points, okay? Uh, now, um, there's a huge amount of information and help uh, available for ggplot. So within RStudio itself, there's a, there's a click to a uh, visualization cheat sheet, which has a bunch of um, drawings of the plot you might want and code for how to produce it. Um, there's a whole book written on it, which has just been updated um, to the latest version. Uh, there's obviously a website um, describing all of the, uh, uh, the package functions. Um, sites such as Stack Overflow are quite useful um, for um, finding or asking questions and for finding previous previously asked questions um, of how to do things in ggplot2. Uh, ChatGPT knows how to write ggplot2 code. You can ask it and Google um, will of course be helpful as well. So the grammar of graphics is essentially um, a bunch of building blocks that are uh, sort of strung together in a chain in order to produce a plot. Okay, so you start with a data set, which is always the same format, which is a data frame. And we'll be looking at what a data frame is uh, later, but basically it's like a rectangular array of data, like we saw before with the, with the words. So columns uh, for variables and rows for observations. Uh, then it recognizes that each chart has a set of aesthetics, which are basically the visual things on the chart. And so there's a way of mapping our uh, visual things on the chart to uh, our data. So there's things like the position of the of points, uh, the color, the fill, the shape, um, the transparency, all sorts of stuff. Uh, then it recognizes that charts are made up of a bunch of geometry. Uh, so there's point charts, there's line charts, there's box plots, histograms, densities, all sorts of things. Um, and then there's ways to change things. So there's um, the different coordinate systems, uh, different scales, there's statistical transformations like log, uh, like logging uh, variables. Um, and then there's the concept of faceting, uh, which we'll get to later, which is a great way of showing the same chart five times for different groups. Okay, all in one command. So we're going to um, quickly look at some, some data on some penguins. Uh, so it's available um, in the Palmer Penguins package. Okay, and you can see that we've got a bunch of variables and a bunch of uh, measurements of each penguin. Um, and we can plot it with the same set of code that we saw before, right? So this code here, ggplot, uh, we tell it what data set we want. We want a point plot, so a scatter plot. And then we have a mapping that maps from the features of the plot, the x and the y axis, to uh, features in the data, the flipper length and body mass columns. Okay, so when we write a chart in uh, ggplot, there's a recipe that we follow, and we always follow the same recipe. The only thing that differs uh, that differs from plot to plot are the ingredients that we put in. Okay, and sometimes a number of ingredients. And so it's always we tell R that we want to plot with the ggplot command, and we feed it the data. All right, so that's usually done in one line. And then we choose the type of chart that we want by adding a geometry. So before we looked at ge geom point, and then we tell it how we get from the features of our data to the features of the plot with a mapping, okay? So here's the recipe. We start with a ggplot. So we tell ggplot which data we want. So we're gonna be using the penguins data set. We then add on a geometry, which describes the type of chart that we want. And we can put multiple geometries in as well. We'll see how to do that later. So in this case, we're wanting points. So we're wanting a scatter plot. Okay, and then we tell it, okay, you're wanting points and these the X and the Y location of each point. Where do I get that from, right? So the X is taken from the flipper length in millimeters from the penguins data. So that's a column in the penguins data. And the Y is taken from the body mass in the penguins data set. And then from there, it automatically uh, figures out the axes, plots it, gives you uh, a guide and so on. This thing makes it easy to alter. So for example, if I want to change the color of the points based on the species of penguin, then I just, that's just another aesthetic, right? So the, the point has its location plus its color now. Okay, and the color is taken from the species column. 
and it will all remember you give us a, a wee guide here so that we know which species is what. Okay, so the process when we're writing a, uh, when we're creating a chart is to always follow the recipe. And this is what we'll be looking at in the first workshop um, later this week. Now, I will say that the workshops are probably the most important part of the course. Okay, so there's two workshops every week. Um, if you're at Manawatu or, um, Alb or Albany and can, and can come, then please do come in person because it's the best way of getting us. We're there, captured, if you like. You can ask us as many things as you like. So it's a great place to just come along and work through the workshop um, while we're there because if you have a question, you can just ask it straight away. Um, you're, you can do it on your own time if you wish. And obviously um, over half of you are in fact studying by distance, uh, which is great. Uh, all the workshops are available to you for the first block already. Uh, so you're welcome to uh, to do them. You're welcome to go ahead if you wish to. Um, that's fine as well. Um, you're welcome to do them before you show up to the workshop if you like. Uh, for distance students, for um, uh, there will be a screencast um, published every week um, where I will go through the workshop myself and babble on about what I'm doing and so on um, for you to look at. Uh, you're welcome to to look at that either while you're doing it or um, after if you have any questions um, and there will also be an online session on Thursdays from seven to eight for anyone ideally distance students but internals can can show up as well if they want um, which will be on the same zoom link zoom link um, where um, essentially the question and answer sessions where you can ask me any questions you have about the workshops and I'm happy to to help in any way I can Okay, so that's it. I shall stop recording.